My name is John Arnold. Some of my team's running in late, it's great. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to uh, hear me talk today. I wanna thank RailsConf, first of all, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, this is my first RailsConf, it's been awesome. Um, it's great to be back in Kansas City. I was actually born and raised here. Anybody else? Go Royals, et cetera, all the stuff, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm from Kansas, I'm not a huge sports guy, sorry. Uh, I'm from Kansas City, I live in Nashville. Uh, it was great to come home for a visit. I got to see my mom, because you know Mother's Day is this week, so that's important, go moms. Uh, this is a good definition of how my, uh, my week has been uh, thus far. Uh, constant meat sweats from the barbecue, um, but what we're really here to talk about today is uh, growing pains uh, in a small company. That's what my talk is called, uh, or thinking big when you're small. Nobody knows the growing pains? Growing Pains, the TV show? No, okay, all right, fine. Uh, okay, so thinking big is fun, uh, but in a small company, a small team, we need to organize our thoughts, our work, and our team to be effective today. Uh, startup culture has put a really bad habit into a lot of us, especially those of us who aren't technical. Um, we start to frame out this idea of what a great trajectory of a startup will be. Uh, we wanna hire some uh, code ninjas, some Jedi, some rock stars to come in. Uh, really just some nerds at the end of the day to help us slam out an MVP. We'll just slap a little business on it, and before you know it, we'll be in the Unicorn Club, sipping our sidecars, and planning our second Mars base. <laughs> Does, by the way, doesn't Elon Musk just look like a supervillain right here? It's, uh, you're coming to Mars, kid. All right, um, so uh, in, in reality, though, the teams that we build don't look like that, and people have talked a lot about hiring already, about how silly it is uh, to call people that. Um, there's great articles out there about how what we're really looking to hire are actually scientists and librarians. Ghostbusters? No? Nobody's seen Ghostbusters in this crowd? Okay, fine. All right. Scientists and librarians. All right, thanks. Um, we don't really have this rocket-like trajectory. We have this startup curve that's been around for a while. Um, you know, companies like ours, we're small. We're like 15 people. We're somewhere in this trough of sorrow. Um, we have some false hope wiggles that like give us excitement. We hire people, then we get big, we do all the crazy stuff. Um, and there's these crashes and all these things that start to happen. Um, you know, Jeremy uh, mentioned this in the keynote yesterday, uh, but what we're actually building is not actually startups at the end of the day. We're building small businesses, we're building companies. And um, the latter half of this curve is not to get sold. Like, I hate whoever wrote that, that it's a buyer. For me, it's not really to get sold. It's to build something that's going to be a sustainable team and a sustainable company. Um, that does not mean that we hustle. No hustle, no side hustles, no weekend crushing, blah, 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 blah. No. Um, I don't want you to hero dev, Mike, our CTO. No more hero dev, no overnights, nothing like that. I want you to be a cultivator. I want you to garden. I want you to lay out standards and defend them and be boring with the standards. Lay them out and stick to them. Um, so anyway, about our company a little bit. We're a multi-tenant SaaS company. We're built on Rails. Uh, we sell our product to global insurance companies. So big, gigantic, multinational companies that are implemented all over the world, have terrible infrastructures, terrible technology, everything else. Um, and it, yeah, it's great. I love our clients. Yeah, hi. Uh, so we uh, have a behavioral economics model that we use to incentivize uh, insurance policyholders to change their life, hence Life.io. Um, and we've, we've done some things differently, uh, the biggest of which being, like I said, we're about 15 people, but we're implemented with these massive, massive companies all around the world. Um, uh, our dev team is not that 15, by the way. Our dev team is like five people. Yeah, so we're a really small team pushing out work that touches hundreds of thousands of people, even larger as we're continuing to scale. Um, and we've learned that the product that we build is really just, um, uh, the software part is really just a portion of the overall product. Uh, the team and the promises that we make both to each other and to our clients is actually what matters. Um, with limited resources and constraints, companies just like ours, we have to bloom where we're planted and seek opportunities where they come uh, in order to maximize wins. We can't just go out and try to find something, close it. We have to make it work where we're at. Um, so we've, we've been around for about four years and have come from a very small app to a little bit bigger app, a little bit bigger team, uh, lots of things happening. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tactics and the philosophies that we've used to get us those four years. 
the first and most important tactic is to steal. Um, I am a certified stealing shit that works practitioner. That, that badge indicates that. Um, that is a real thing. You can get that on the internet. It's great. Um, so we use frameworks that help us instill clarity, vision, focus, value. These are all things that Jeremy mentioned in the keynote yesterday. Um, we've stolen a ton of frameworks. We've thrown a bunch out. So these are just some that work well for us today. Um, jobs to be done. We took this from ThoughtBot. Um, and Intercom, like, this week released a book on this, too. Uh, basically, the, the question is, what job is the user hiring the product to do? What are we replacing in their life or making better by using software technology instead of something like paper? Um, what, what motivation is happening for the user today? It's a really simple question to ask. Um, we write about four or five of these for our users and about two or three for our clients. What are they here for? What do they actually want? They're very simple words. They're very simple sentences. They're not these huge long stories or press releases or whatever. Just like, what are they here for? Um, we also use this great uh, framework called 666, which I call the devil's framework. Not really. Um, oh, whoa, whoa. There was a devil, yeah. Speak of the devil, hey. Uh, all right, so really what this means, this is a roadmap process. Um, this means six weeks, six months, and six years. Uh, sales hates this. Six years, no client will ever buy six years. We've got to buy tomorrow. What's it going to be tomorrow? We can't do six years. What does that mean? Um, so six years, though, is really, man, oh, oh. six years is really this. Um, six weeks, what are our current team actions? What are the things we're doing today? Six months, what are the priorities that we have that are directionalizing us? And then six years, what is the worldview like? What is, what is it that we believe unwaveringly that is, that is really defining the product? Um, when, you, um, when you mix this framework with user interviews, feedback, team workshops, other people have talked about that already this week, um, uh, it defines the opinions and it sharpens that worldview. Now what's cool is when you mix that with that jobs framework, you, oh man, you get something like this. Um, six weeks, we change with the user's ability. Then we start to change their behavior. And then six years is really a question of how have we changed the user's life as a result of using our product? Um, and that right there, especially those latter two things, um, are what we can actually sell to a big client. They get excited about this. How do we actually fit into this picture? And what does this look like? How do we come along for the ride? Um, and the other result of this, too, is every feature that we build has a roadmap like this. Um, every big piece, we know where it's going. It exists in the platform for a reason. Uh, and it has something that is uh, an opinionated worldview at the end of the day that we have to define and defend. Otherwise, we won't build it. We don't, we don't have time to build it. Um, all right, so uh, another thing we've stolen uh, is a concept called Fun Day. I think this was at RubyConf last year. Um, Basically, it's maintaining a list of nice-to-have items, uh, technical debt, even though it's not always really that fun, uh, and things that we know we need to do but maybe don't have time to do right now. Uh, what happens a lot in our team is we'll start down a new road, we'll start planning some requirements, we'll start building out something, and we'll hit a block. Um, we're small, we have to pause, we have to get design, which is contract right now, we don't have full-time design. Um, to come in and help us with these things. And so while those pieces are being built, those blocks are being cleared, our team dips back into these items um, for a day or two, does something that they've enjoyed, that they want to get back into, um, and that balances new feature development, that balances client deliverables with technical debt. Um, everything we've talked about right now is important because uh, fundamentally, I believe that every company needs a secret at its center as you can see here in this diagram. Uh, Uber and Airbnb are canonical examples of this. Uh, they have taken a secret that they, they found in the world that individuals have unused assets, cars and houses, empty rooms, and found that they can make money on them. They built upon that secret and actually built software that sat upon that um, and made something great. Um, we have a secret, I don't wanna tell you, we have a secret. Uh, I think everybody needs a secret like that that, inf that informs and defines their worldview. Um, all of that fits into uh, a list of the priorities that we keep. Uh, so when it comes to actually choosing what to build, what to market, what to deliver, uh, we talk about these five things. What do we believe in unwaveringly that we will never back down from? Um, what are improvements? Uh, you can talk about 10x and all that kind of stuff. What are sm small improvements, big improvements we can make on things we've just put out? 
Um, prioritize user research and feedback. Find things that are on vision from that feedback to put into the cycle. And then scaling, growth, quality, and stability. Uh, those five things are how we prioritize our roadmap. Uh, things we believe in sometimes involves things our clients believe in, if they're paying us to do that. Uh, <laughs> it depends. But um, the things that we on Waverly believe in really, really ultimately guide our priorities. So uh, a small company like ours, we also have to sell a lot. Um, for us, when we're talking about selling to clients, it's really more like consulting someone who wants to buy your product. Um, Andreessen Howard said it's harder to get a law passed in Congress than to sign a big software client. And I think that's absolutely true. You have corporate layers and approvals and legal, technology, um, infrastructure, procurement. You have all these people that you need to, to get on board. You have to pass their bars. You have to go through all the different pieces to actually build something um, for them. But like I said, it's really at the end of the day more about consulting. It's what are your objectives? Uh, let's define those together. We do client-facing workshops where we meet with prospects and actually plan out what their objectives are for using software like ours. And then after we know those objectives, we've kind of coaxed them out of them. A lot of times they don't know. Um, we coax those out of them and then show how we can use our software to help them. Um, we use frameworks like strategic alignment and design thinking and all those sorts of things to really understand what their problem is and then show them how uh, they fit into our plot, to our, our solution for the future. Back to the whole like six week, month, year thing. Um, we show them from that how they fit into the six month and the six year vision and how they can have their own version of that too for moving forward. Uh, we also have to sell to our team. Um, we need to sell that vision and remind them that what they're working on fits um, into the product. It's, you know, if it's a part of the marketing, the, the overall experience, the engagement, um, the vision that we, we want to talk, uh, that we, we keep communicating, it, goes, it gets to the point of it being annoying to our team. Uh, we, we talk about it so much. It's like, I know, I understand, I know. Uh, we have to do that because um, it's very easy to get focused on one thing, get a different vision of it, and start to veer off course. So reminding of how that one little feature, that one enhancement, that one fix, uh, is going to uh, put another brick into the road for the future. Um, that's always how we have to, to sell, sell new work to our team. Um, another thing we do all the time is we, be, is we are wrong. I'm wrong all the time. I have to talk to these guys, I have to talk to all sorts of people, um, state my opinions, state my research findings, state whatever it may be, uh, and be wrong. So um, in, in terms of being wrong, uh, it is incredibly important to choose your losses. And there's a very simple framework for this to follow, too. Um, it's, it's easy to choose losses with a client when they're going to pay you for the, for the change, when there's something you disagree with. Um, that's very easy to, to change your mind. Um, it's, um, it's harder when it's, when it's dealing with things the team's recommending, uh, when it's talking about um, you know, directions we should take with partners, integrations, uh, all, all sorts of things like that. So how do you know what to be OK with losing at? Um, the way I think about it is in terms of micro and macro. Um, I've talked a little bit about vision, or probably a lot about vision so far. Um, the, the grand story arc of your product, this kind of macro arc, um, that six-year arc of where are we going to be when this thing's all said and done, um, that is a place that you, um, you don't want to lose at. But in the micro, in the day-to-day -day transactions, in those smaller pieces, um, there's things in there that can be undefined. There's things in there that can change and that you can, you can lose at. Um, in the micro, those are places that you can experiment and fail. Um, and it's actually really great to make lots of mistakes here. Uh, you can fix those mistakes quickly. You can learn from them quickly. And they don't actually impact much, um, even though they might feel huge in that moment. Um, however, when it comes to that large arc, those unwavering things that you believe in, uh, those are things that you have to be resolute at. Um, and you have to be right at those. So that comes from, again, user research, client research, all those learning pieces, but your own unwavering belief in what you're doing and where that vision is gonna be, um, you have to be right on that, even if you give up on those small things. Another thing we do a lot is say no. Um, we say no to our sales team a lot. We say no to our executives. Uh, to clients, to users, to the team, 
uh, you have to say no more than you say yes. Um, uh, Jeremy mentioned this in the keynote yesterday. You need to build a mobile app. We had that same thing. Investors want us to build a mobile app. And um, our clients aren't paying for it yet. And our users, that would be nice, but they're probably not going to need it for a little while. Um, we have to say no to that. Even though it's probably going to get us more investment money, it's going to divert so many resources from us and take us off our focus that that short-term money is not worth that diversion. Um, other reasons to say no, uh, we have so many good ideas. Um, every startup does. There's a zillion good ideas. There's things to put into the product. Um, the team's really smart. Good ideas come out all the time. We see competitors doing things. Clients are asking for things. Um, but you have to pick and choose. And the way you pick and choose at this size uh, is what's being paid for. What are you being asked to do that's actually going to keep the lights on? Um, and there's two kinds of payment that I'm talking about here. Yes, clients and users who are paying us to use the software, that's part of it. But we also have to go where the user's time is. Um, that is a form of paying too, time and attention. So what's preventing a user from onboarding? What's pre preventing them from coming back? What's preventing them from loving the product? Those are the things that you should think of as being paid for because it's, it's the user spending time with you. Uh, and those are things you should be focused on. Again, what supports the vision? You have to prioritize ideas and work only on those that fit those grand future visions that you have. Um, and think in terms of systems. So in order to get to this big feature, these other pieces have to sit in first. We have to put these next bricks in place first. Um, each of those steps, you know, X to, Z to Y to Z, um, needs to fit into that macro story arc. And needs to have a place when you write out that story. Uh, we say no. We also say yes. We say yes a little less frequently than we say no. Um, but there are many things inside of those that we can enthusiastically say yes to. Uh, these are the same list we just looked at, just looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, first, there's so many good ideas. Our team is so smart, and they're right all the time. And they're really thoughtful and considered, and they come up with really great things to do um, that will help us achieve the goal. Yes, yes, yes to that. Again, what's being paid for? Even if... The, um, if it's something that we've disagreed with and the client's willing to pay for it, uh, something that we want to add on later, new functionality that we have to change or do something else, uh, if, they said, if we've said no to it a bunch of times uh, and they still want it, make them pay for it. Then do it. Then say yes. It's easy. And then again, what supports the, the vision? Um, thinking about systems um, is incredibly important for uh, the, pr the progression of features in a system is incredibly important for what you're going to be building. Um, and sometimes, especially to, to leadership, people who aren't on the team day in and day out, those little steps seem like detours. They seem like forks in the road that we, we shouldn't be going that way. We should clearly be going this way. Um, but every one of those features gets to, gets to be expressed as, because we have this, now we can go build that. And that's kind of the, the path we have to take. Uh, another thing we do a lot is we change often. We change processes all the time. There's a couple of frameworks that we use here uh, for this. A uh, couple of mantras that I have that we really hold on to here. Um, the first of which is happily dissatisfied. Um, this is something to keep in hand when we think about the work. Uh, was I happy with our last release? Yeah, I was pretty happy with it. It went pretty well. Uh, was I satisfied with it? No. In no way was I satisfied. Uh, was, I satis was I happy with that last client interaction? Yeah, that went pretty well. But was I satisfied? No. Um, that is a great place to keep yourself, to go, yeah, we did well, but we can always do better. Um, and better is really the mantra word underneath everything. There's always something we can improve. There's always a system or a process that we can, we can use to make things better. Um, and we'll talk about how to pick and choose those, how to fit those in with um, everything else we have going on. A um, couple of, of easy process things. Style guides, to me, are actually the product that we're building. Um, our team needs to focus on repeatable styles. That's you know on the Rails side, the front end, the design, the content style guides. Uh, these minimize team frustration, cut out guesswork, and um, you know we learned that the hard way. We're still learning it. Um, the nice thing though is you can pull out uh, sample style guides. Um, uh, on the content side, Slack has a style guide for how they talk to their users in the app. Take that. Use it, uh, tweak it to fit your own voice, but you can start with that. It's a complete thought. It's done. 
Um, other, other style guides like that exist all over the place that you can, you can um, take and, and modify to your own purposes. Um, so the style guides, like I said, those really are the product. And the software that we build that users and clients interact with is really just the expression of that product. Um, so focus on style guides. They're going to be way more repeatable, way more um, uh, extensible than just one-off requests. What are ways you can make things repeatable and, and find ways to build features and build functionality inside of those style guides for the future? Um, Rebecca talked about this before. She did a great job about this. Defining processes when you fail. Uh, when you're small, this is the main opportunity that you have to build a process. Um, you know, we're, we're a small team, like I said. We don't do, in terms of our like, product development process, we don't do story points, and we don't do estimates. We don't even do structured sprints. We tried, because I came in and was like, oh, let's, tie, let's do all the stuff and put on the tie and make it all fancy. And it wasn't needed, and it took so much time from our team that it was less focused on the actual work. Uh, it's what we call the work of the work. Um, as opposed to the actual work. So working on the work and doing the work are two different things. And at this stage, we have to focus as much on the actual work as we possibly can. So put in, in place only the processes that you need to prevent failure. Um, and extending on dry, don't repeat your mistakes. When you have a mistake, stop and talk about it and institute a process. There's a zillion processes out there for those things, but you have to step in the trap before you, um, you institute the process, otherwise you just waste time. Um, so Rebecca talked about this, but I want to talk about this too, postmortems. Um, it's, uh, it's a great place, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to, um, to talk with your team when things go wrong or when they go well. And this is probably the most structured thing that we do uh, is a retrospective with postmortems. Um, running a good po postmortem takes two things. Um, objective facts, so Rebecca said some great stuff about this, so I won't go too much into that, but um, basically objective facts about the failure or the success, um, statements that explain the story. It should be a really boring story listed out as a series of sentences. Um, the client asked us to do X. Uh, we responded with this document. Then this happened, then this happened. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be adjectives, there shouldn't be lots of names, it should just be these facts and events happened. Um, and then the team, the people who are involved with the failure or the learning, uh, do what's called a plus delta exercise. And all this really says is for each of those objective statements, plus what went well about this? What are we gonna do again about this? And delta, what needs to change for the future? How should we build something differently for this? And this right here is where our processes come to life. We find those things that we need to add so that the mistakes don't happen again. This process takes maybe half an hour, and we make few enough big mistakes that we can handle one of these every few weeks, and it's no big deal. Um, but it sets in motion a lot of good processes and best practices, things to add to our style guide, to our implementation process, to our deployment process, uh, that we make sure that are gonna happen for the future. Sound good? Feeling good? Okay. All right. Good. Uh, all right. Uh, other things. Uh, we grow slowly. Slowly. Grow slowly. It's very easy to get money and go, we need to hire a bunch of people. We're going to be awesome. We have this crate. We want to make a Mars base. Here we go. It's time to make our Mars base. No. You have to grow slowly, and you, you might be able to extend um, or, or add to or augment your team and the work that you get done, but you shouldn't think, now we can turn this, turn this thing on and start churning. I, I'm saying this to myself a lot too because I wanna grow fast and we have to be reminded to grow slowly. Seriously, more slowly than you want to. Um, there's been some great talks about hiring. Uh, Eric and Joe, I think, gave some great talks about this this week. Um, but a um, couple things that we've kind of stumbled into and have found worked really well. Um, hiring generalists, um, or people who have switched careers um, is great as you start to grow. People who can do multiple things in the organization. Um, and people with history in other areas that are applicable to your team. Uh, we have a developer here who was a, an editor. That's really helpful for our content side of things. Developer who was in um, the healthcare world. We have kind of a health slant to our app. So getting people who can help out when there's other things that need to happen. Because our team's small. We don't have people who are focused on those things. Sorry, I'm making you nervous. I'm talking about you too. Okay, all right. Um, 
So this is another ThoughtBot thing that I stole, but uh, T-shaped people. Um, T-shaped people are people with um, a high level um, of specialty or experience in several areas that would be applicable to the work that we're doing, and one deep specialty, um, obsession, uh, passion, fascination, curiosity that goes deep in one area. I want to come in and um, I'm really interested in wearable devices, and I really want to focus in on that. But I was, um, I did some project management, and I did some this, and I did some this in my future, in my past. That is a person that you want to look for who's going to take the team further um, as you continue to grow. Uh, more about growth. Um, I always say it's better done okay. I don't always say this. Um, it's, be it's better done okay uh, than done great by somebody you have to lay off later. Grow slowly. Don't overhire. Um, focus on the roles that your team needs, not people. Um, People are expensive, and you hurt them, and they stay with you um, until they run out of things to do. Uh, roles can be played by, by multiple people. You can have multiple hats today okay. Um, and yes, it might be a little bumpy, but using the failures and shortcomings of those roles uh, will define the job description for the person that you need for the future. Does that make sense? So fail to build the thing for the future. Um, okay, last big thing. Uh, this is a great concept. There's a company called Infusionsoft. They're based out of Phoenix. Uh, I think they use PHP, which, you know, whatever. Um, they are awesome. They are a small business CRM. They have a gazillion clients. Um, and they started in a couple dudes' garage, like classic startup story. Um, and they have this great wall. Uh, it's actually some doors uh, in their office. And they call this their Everest mission. Um, basically, what this, this, the doors were, maybe you can see as it went, um, mission, vision, their core values, um, what their purpose is as a company. Uh, and then there were, there were summits each year that showed where they wanted to be as a company, the size, the number of clients, the things they wanted to do, um, the, the different milestones that they want to hit along the way. First off, uh, awesome that it's that visible. This is the main doors to their conference room, like their big all-hands conference room. Uh, everybody sees this at least once a week. Everybody's reminded of this. It is physically printed in the, in the room so that people can see it. Um, but second, on either side of this thing uh, are huge, boring spreadsheets that they've printed off that have a list of key objectives, key results, people's names, and timelines for every single thing that was on that on the bottom parts of the door. And at, what's amazing, they printed this like four years ago and they've hit those numbers like dead on every single year. Um, I can't say on the finance side or the business side about all those things, but um, in terms of achieving the growth goals and the team goals that they wanted to make, meet, um, they use an OKR process. Um, Intel, I think, started this, but Google made this really famous. Um, objectives, a company provided goal. So those six month uh, future views, the months, like what are our current priorities? And then key results. Um, the way we implement this is uh, we assemble teams within our company. We're a small teams, so there's not that many to begin with, but a few groups of people um, to focus in on one of those objectives. And that group writes the key results. We don't force it down their throats. We don't say, this is the stuff you gotta do or you're fired. They come up with how to achieve the goal. And all we do is check in and make sure that that's working and make sure that we're hitting it. Um, so what that does is it gives the team ownership. Um, it gives them those clear objectives and it shows how they fit into the big picture. It lets them find their place and blossom inside of where we're blossoming. Um, and it gives freedom to fail too. Um, these are not like performance review. We're going to look at these once a quarter or annually or whatever. These are things that weekly we are checking in on and measuring against and making sure that they're moving us in the direction that we want to be. So remember, pursue your vision relentlessly. Be annoying in talking about your vision. Your clients should know it. Your team should know it. Your pets should know it. Everyone should know it. And everything you do should be part of your talking points. Be systematic in completing it. 
What are the pieces that lead to the next step? Now that we've done that, we can do this. Once that's done, we'll be here. And then you rattle out the vision again, always there. Um, choose your battles. Don't be afraid to lose. You can lose now. Losing is a learning opportunity. It's a growth opportunity. Uh, losing in the short term might mean that, that the client sees you as flexible and willing to work well with them and wants to continue the partnership. That's worked with us. We had to concede a lot to grow a lot. Um, and speaking of growth, change often, but grow slowly. Let your team define its own path um, based upon those key visions, and hopefully it'll all fall into place. Questions? Thank you.